Blacks in Technology. Black, 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 blacks in technology. Blacks in technology. Black, blacks in technology. Blacks in technology. Black, blacks in technology. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Blacks in Technology Bit Tech Talk podcast. This is uh, podcast episode number 91 with Denise Davis, Crushing Code at the Washington Post. I'm your host this evening. My name is Greg Greenlee, and if this is your first time uh, listening to the podcast, you can check out Blacks and Technology at www.blacksandtechnology.net. You can also follow us on Twitter. We're at Black and Technology. That's B-L-K-I-N-T-E-C-H-N-O-L-O-G-Y. We're also on Facebook, and that's facebook.com forward slash Blacks and Technology. And we also have an ever-growing LinkedIn group under Blacks and Technology. Uh, if you are on Twitter right now, if you have any questions for our guests, tweet them using the hashtag BitTechTalk, B-I-T-T-E-C-H-T-A-L-K, BitTechTalk. Uh, BitTechTalk is a podcast. It's a show where we talk to people of color who are engineers, innovators, educators, inventors, and entrepreneurs doing amazing things in the world of technology. This podcast is where they share their experiences, ideas, knowledge, and perspective on tech with the the, uh, BIT community. Blacks in Technology is a tech-focused community and media organization, and we're focused on increasing diversity in technology. We're always focused on forming new partnerships and opportunities to assist our members with their continued professional growth and development. So if you want to partner with us, send us an email to Contact us at blacksandtechnology.net. Any general inquiries or inquiries related to sponsorship. So if you ever want to sponsor one of these fabulous podcasts, send those also to contact us at blacksandtechnology.net. And uh, so announcements. What do we have for announcements today? So um, I think I mentioned uh, last podcast, self-conference is coming up in Detroit. That's May 20th and 21st. Um, we were there last year. We're going to be there again this year. And when I say we, I mean Blacks and Technology. And I'm pretty sure there's going to be a meetup. So um, last year we had a, a pretty nice turnout for our meetup. Hopefully we'll have even more people there this year. And if you've never um, been to self-conference, it's a uh, – a mix of fantastic tech presentations, insightful tech talks, and it's located in downtown Detroit. Uh, it's two whole days uh, in the middle of May filled with mobile, web, hardware, software, process, and team-oriented talks to help you expand your knowledge and meet other technically-minded folks and immerse yourself in Detroit's tech renaissance. So that's uh, Self-Conference, and that's uh, selfconference.org, I believe. Uh, and that's happening in May, May 20th and 21st. Also, uh, Closure West. It's happening April 15th and 16th in Seattle, Washington. That's the Closure West Conference. If you're interested in the Closure language, uh, definitely check that out. We are a diversity sponsor for them, and there are free tickets available. So check our website out um, here in the next couple of days. We'll put something up. If you're interested in attending Closure West, if you're out that way and you want to get a free ticket, check us out, and uh, maybe we can hook you up. so what's going on in the world of jobs? There's a few job postings on the website right now. Uh, Sparkbox out of Dayton, Ohio, is looking for a front-end designer. Uh, Gravity Tank, they're out of Chicago, Illinois. They're looking for an interaction developer. Uh, Grand Circus out of Detroit, they're looking for a coding boot camp instructor, uh, preferably uh, knowledge in Java or .NET and C Sharp, and Stripe. Uh, The payment company out of San Francisco is looking for a recruiting coordinator. Um, Check us out on Slack as well. If you check our website out and uh, you do a search for Slack, you'll see the invite form uh, in that article. Uh, We're up to 415 members. Um, It's pretty big. Um, Once we started out not too long ago and we we were growing pretty fast, this week we had a surge in uh, the number of people participating uh, so uh, we're up to 415. I tweeted out earlier this week that we are up to 400, and just in the last like day or two, uh, we shot up. So uh, check us out on Slack. There's always some very interesting conversations going on in there, um, you know, related to um, anything from software to hardware to um, you know, virtualization. 
to even social issues. So uh, we talk about it all. It's pretty pretty active. Uh, startup of the week, that's Blacks and Technologies. Um, our startup of the week focuses on spotlighting and promoting tech-based startup companies founded by people of color. I have people of color in top leadership positions. If you like your startup company to be featured, uh, check us out. Uh, check any of the past articles, the past startup of the week articles out, and there's a uh, link at the bottom where you can fill out a form uh, for a startup of the week. So what I'm trying to do is I figure there should be at least 52 uh, startups that are led by people of color or founded by people of color somewhere in the United States or wherever, I should be able to get at least 52 participants in this, and I should have be able to have one every week uh, for the next year. So far, I think we've done four, three or four, and I've got some more in queue. Um, right now, our startup of the week is Retrace Health, and they are making primary care affordable, convenient, and personal. Uh, so check that out, Retrace Health, um, on our startup of the week. And if you like your uh, your startup feature, fill out the form uh, that's uh, on our website there. So uh, check us out and get your startup feature. All right, and let's see what's next. We're going to get right into our guest. Uh, I'm happy to uh, bring on Anise Davis. Uh, Anise is an Android uh, Google developer expert. She uh, has a BS in computer engineering from the University of Maryland College Park. She has spent the past five years developing applications for the Android ecosystem across multiple form factors. She is also an international conference speaker and author, sharing her knowledge of Android development with others. In the past, she has worked for Lockheed Martin and NASA. Uh, and NASA. And uh, right now, uh, we're going to get into that. I'm, I'm going to um, let her... Uh, let's cut out the bag, uh, but welcome to the show, Anise. Thank you so much for having me. Our um, pleasure is all ours. Definitely uh, glad that you could join us. Uh, so um, tell us, um, what? Tell us about, uh, give us a little bit about your background. Where are you from, your education, how you got started in tech? So um, I grew up in Washington, D.C., um, and Around, I guess, like nine or 10, we moved to Maryland, um, Prince George's County. And so that's where um, I attended high school, Eleanor Roosevelt. Um, and there they actually had a science and technology program um, that I was able to participate in. Um, and, and from there, um, I went to University of Maryland College Park, as you mentioned, um, and I did my degree in computer engineering, uh, which, which was actually very fun. <laughs> Uh, a cross section between computer science and electrical engineering. Um, so it was nice to be the guinea pig at the time um, for that new program that Maryland was running. Nice. So, uh, so I attended college for computer network engineering, and uh, one of the, of the things, and it sort of um, sort of like what you what your curriculum was like. So there was you know, um, computer networking involved, but there was also this piece that I didn't realize at the time was engineering. So you actually took a lot of actual engineering classes, for instance, like AC circuits, DC circuits, you took like digital analysis, digital sequential logic. So did, were those some of the classes that, that you had to partake in as well? Yeah, so we had to do a lot of work with like circuits, understanding um, capacitors and resistors and how those things work together. Um, a lot of classes on like thermal dynamics, digital signal processing. I mean, it's interesting that I use none of that today, <laughs> but I had to learn it at the time. <laughs> you know, same here. It's funny um, because I loved it while I was doing it, right? So I'm in class and, and we had a, um, um, uh, what was it? Uh, digital combinational logic, and that was kind of that was the introduction to uh, circuitry. And uh, so we would have these breadboards and all these uh, uh, um, uh, integrated circuits, and uh, we would take wires and you know connect the leads and everything like that. And uh, we would have these switches that we would uh, switch on and off to 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 make sure that our, the circuit that we built actually worked. Um, and I love doing that stuff. I love the hands-on aspect of it, and I, lo I love learning about how uh, uh, electronics and everything work. 
but I use none of that right now, none, none whatsoever. Even when, you know, there was a class that I took, uh, it was sort of like, um, or I guess it was assembly. Uh, it was uh, microprocessors, I think the class was. And uh, we did some assembly programming on a real probably irrelevant um, processor, some Motorola process, probably something used for like embedded um some embedded circuitry or something. Um, but I love that class. I even love, you know, doing this, but I don't, I don't do any assembly program. <laughs> right. yeah, so. So all that stuff is now lost. It's funny. Cause I just, I just went back. I still have, I, I still have the books because, you know, the college that I went to, it seemed like they changed books like every term. So like even you'll, you'll buy the books and the books will be like a hundred bucks and you'll go to turn them back in and we're like, Nope, we're, we're not, we don't, you know, we're not using that book this term or something like that. So I have all these books. I have one on principle of electric, uh, electric circuits and uh, another one, digital fundamentals. And I just picked that back up and started reading it again because, I, you know, I, I kind of wanted to get a little bit more um, familiar with, you know, some of the past knowledge that I lost, I guess. Um, so are you, do you catch yourself doing anything like that? Or, or are you working with, uh, uh, like, any type of, circuitry or hardware at all like even in your spare time absolutely not I pretty much um, (laughs) by my junior year in college I realized that programming was for me and I just finished the electrical engineering stuff because I had to Um, I was already so far into my degree and then I never looked back gotcha gotcha that's one so um, so you majored in computer engineering. Well, so what was your ex- experience like, especially being a, a woman of color? We hear, you know, a bunch of stories out there about, you know, um, you know, people feeling kind of outcasted or, or, or not getting any attention uh, that the other students might get. What, what was your experience like? Um, so just based on my personality, like I'm just very much an introvert. So I definitely uh-huh. kept to myself in school. And also there was just other dynamic is the fact that I was on a scholarship and I wanted to make sure I completed my degree in that four year period because I didn't want to have any student loans after graduating. So I was just super focused, really heads down, um, trying to push through and, and do well and maintain my scholarship in school. Um, and, and But with that being said, by my junior year, I was inducted into um, the Electrical and Computer Engineering Honor Society, and that sort of gave me the opportunity to be, um, thank you, to just be more involved with people. Um, So I would participate more in the chapter events, um, and I was the fundraising chair, and so then I would also join study groups and things after that. Um, And Mm -hmm. it actually was a good experience interacting um, with fellow students for a change um, at that point. Right, right. So, were there any challenges that you that you did face, and if so, how did you how did you overcome those? Yeah, I'd say the biggest challenge was being one of the few women in the program. Um, so, whenever there was lab work or maybe a group project, it just seemed right. like everyone else knew each other, and they would quickly pair up. And so, <laughs> then you end up on this team where it's the people no one else wanted to work with. So I'd often um, have to do most of the work. Um, And then even on certain projects, like I'd go to the computer lab and they would be individual assignments, but I'd see groups of people working together as a team to complete the work, Mm -hmm. uh, which of course is extremely unfair. Um, But I guess how did I overcome it is that it forced me to see, okay, this is a real world, it's not fair and I need to stand on my own. And I think it just pushed me to become um, a better developer and to do really well with reaching out to professors or teaching assistants um, when I wasn't getting that support from my classmates. Were, you, were your, were your uh, professors, were they pretty responsive uh, with any questions or any, any issues that you had? I would say that my professors did a a pretty decent job, but I think it's also because of my approach. Um, I 
just kind of coming from a different angle, I spent one year as a middle school teacher. And just to think about myself Mm -hmm. as a teacher and what students I sort of um, took to or what students I assisted the most, it wasn't necessarily the smartest person in the class, but it was the people who tried the hardest. And so going back to college, I just tried so hard. I would do all the homework assignments. So I couldn't, I wouldn't just show up at office hours, like, please help me. Um, They would look and they would say, okay, you do all the homework. All right, so let me show you this one problem. Um, And I think that was part of how I was able to have that better working relationship with my professors. Interesting. Yeah, I mean that's a that's a really good tip. Uh you know, showing that initiative and you know, uh ha- having your teachers respond to that in a positive way. You hear all, you hear a lot of horror stories out there about, you know, being ignored or uh teachers not responding or not being responsive to uh, to your needs and things like that. Um and, you know, because we are not there to actually see, you never know like what the dynamics really is, but that's a good way uh, to actually try to build that rapport between you and your teachers, you know, show them that initiative um, um, from the beginning, and 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 maybe that'll help, you know, bring that relationship a little bit closer. Good advice. Right. So, what was the very first program? Go ahead. I'm sorry. No, you go ahead. I'm listening. Okay. Okay. What was the very first program that you wrote? So my first uh, memorable coding project was in Visual Basic, um, and it was a very simple program that exported um, telescope calibration data into this Excel spreadsheet. Um, And I just remember it so well because I wrote it when I was interning at NASA. Um, And it was just such a great feeling of accomplishment to know that um, a student in high school can, you know, do something to help contribute to the success of NASA. Um, so that was just, like, really empowering for me um, as my first really memorable project. That's pretty cool. We had a um, a young lady on last on our last podcast um, that um, um, Camille, Eddie, she, uh, she's a mechanical engineer, uh, and she – has done some work in the past with NASA. Uh, what was that? I mean, what was that experience like? Just you know, um, actually, we're gonna we're gonna get into that later. I, I want to ask you about your experience at NASA. So uh, um, let me let me ask you about uh, mentors. Did you have any uh, mentors coming up, like in high school? You know, to kind of to kind of pushed you into, I wouldn't say push, but kind of helped you along uh, in your in your like technology journey. I didn't really have any mentors, and um, I was the first person in my family to you know even go um, to college to get their bachelor's degree. So I didn't have wow. a lot of examples of people um, just kind of close to me in my life who did it. Um, yeah, but we're in the age of technology. So um, you can definitely kind of go online and you like make your own mentors. And that's sort of what I've been doing over the years is just finding people doing what I want to do um, and mm-hmm. staying in touch with them as best I can, um, you know, via the internet. And that has, that has proved right. to be very helpful. Right. Excellent. So, and you know, I'm I'm going to plug uh, the Blacks and Technology Slack channel uh, right now because, you know, the one of the things that I always like to tell people uh, about the Bit community is that you know, if you're looking for that um, that person, that mentor, somebody that you can talk to, uh, our our community is very very good at doing things like that. So you know, you can, you know. Come to the site. You can ask questions. Uh, you know, you can give advice yourself if you want to. But uh, you know, it's a heck of a resource for people who are are looking to just learn a little bit more or learn how to get into a career in tech or whatever. There's always people out, you know, within our community that that's willing to help and willing to answer questions. Um, and like I said, we're up to over, you know, we got 415 
members in our Slack channel. A lot of them are very active. Uh, so, you know, and we have a, a coding channel within our Slack channel. So if you ever want to pop in and, and there's a lot of, you know, very knowledgeable developers uh, there, you, you know, I'll send you, what I'll do is uh, after this, the podcast is over, I'll email you the link if you, uh, if you want to join. So, um, yeah. Yeah, that would be great. Uh -huh. I really like that. Excellent. Excellent. So how did you how did you get into Android development? How what 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 sparked that? So about five or six years ago, um, I finally moved on from BlackBerry, uh, <laughs> and I got my first Android phone. Um, so wow. of course, <laughs> yeah, I know, right? Um, <laughs> I was a very diehard, um, loyal BlackBerry fan, um, but I finally moved on. I got my first Android phone. And um, since I already knew Java, I really wanted to learn how to make an app for my phone. Uh, so I just taught mm. myself um, Android development using whatever I could find on the Internet. And um, then I started to take a few classes online that were free. Um, and from there, I just kind of kept going and, and really enjoy um, doing Android work. So what, what was it about Android that, that kind of, you know, I guess brung you in and 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 uh, interested you that much that you would uh, want to do that literally for your uh, as a career. I think what I really like about Android is um, the sort of scrappy nature of the programming. Um, it's not all um, high shine and high polish. I'd say like the iOS ecosystem. And I sort okay. of like digging through Stack Overflow, trying to find um, the code snippet that's going to help um, solve my problem. And right. I really, really, really love the Android community. I feel that um, they're low judgment and very welcoming. Um, and I just think it's a great community for people who um, are excited about, you know, what Google has to offer and Android technology. Um, so that's also something that kind of keeps me here. Excellent, excellent. And I, I know what you mean as far as um, it, it's kind of that thing with, um, um, I guess that 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 dynamic between like Linux and, and Windows, right? So uh, <laughs> Linux is that type of operating system. You know, everything is not going to work right out the box, and if it doesn't, then you really got to do. It's it's it's. I used to call it, and it's changing a little bit now uh, because there's um, a lot of distros that are coming out that that are, you know, pretty similar or, or, or relatively easy um, to to operate. You know, so if a person was using Windows for a long time and they switched to it, it, it yeah, it's a, it's a change, but they can still get to it. It's real GUI based and things like that, uh, like um, uh, like Ubuntu, for instance, and and like Mint. Uh, Linux Mint, uh, but before it was really, I mean, you had to be on top of your stuff if you wanted to get into, you know, if you wanted to learn Linux. And I, I like that about it because it, it made you think and it made you understand what was going on within the operating system. And, and when things didn't work, you did have, you had to go to, you know, the forums and go on the internet and you had to Google things and, and you had to change configuration files to get certain things to work. But, you know, there's a certain uh, um, self-gratification with doing things like that and, and learning the innards of, uh, of the, the operating system and then fixing something that maybe didn't work before. It, it keeps your mind working as opposed to, um, you know, so other operating systems that just magically seem to work with everything, you know? So I definitely understand exactly. where you're coming from. Yeah. Yeah. So how what what advice would you give to someone wanting to to get into um Android development? How can people get started? I would, I would say one of the best ways to start is taking a free online course. Um just to see if it's really even for you. Um I took a few okay. classes with Coursera. Um there's also some really good ones on Udacity. Um and these things are available for free. So once you take your first course, you know, hopefully you'll become addicted. Um, and then from there, you just 
really want to get involved with the community. So go to your local meetup, attend conferences. All of those things help accelerate your learning. Excellent. Yeah, and I love Coursera. Uh, they have an excellent Python course that I've been that I've been taking, um, and it's it's great. I love the videos. I love the teaching style. Uh, I love the way that they have it set up. Um, so it's just not. I, you know what? I tried. Um, I tried Code Academy before, and there was something about Code Academy that it just didn't stick. Um, and I know there's a lot of people out there that, that use Code Academy, but I think it was, I think Code Academy, it gives you a little bit too, too much. You know what I'm saying? Like when, when you're, when you're, um, as you're going through the, the, the courses on Code Academy and then you get to like a challenge or something like that, it, it, it actually gives you a little bit too much of the code and it doesn't allow you to kind of, think about it and, 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 and figure things out. It, it almost kind of puts the puzzle pieces there for you uh, and then like leaves one puzzle piece out and, and then it's like, oh, I only got one puzzle piece left. It must, this, it must fit together. <laughs> and it's, and, it, and it, but that doesn't, that doesn't help you be, you know, be able to kind of retain what, what you're learning because they give you a little bit too much and Coursera doesn't do that. It's, it's, um, at least not the Python course. The Python course that I'm taking, so you'll go through the video lectures. There, there's a book that accompanies it as well. And then uh, at the end, there's a, uh, they give you a test. So they'll test you on, uh, on some of the syntax and things like that. And then there's an exercise or two that you have to, you know, they'll give you, they'll give you the parameters and they'll actually give you what the output is supposed to look like. But then you have to fill in everything else. And that recall, you know, is what is what you know helps you to remember what you just learned. And so that's that that that's helped me a lot more than than Code Academy has. Yeah, most courses I've taken with Coursera have a very similar format. Um, and mm. the best part is that they're taught by professors in universities yes. who are teaching these courses to students who are paying for them. Um, so right. it's really nice to be able to participate in this um, and get such high quality content as well. So when did you, when did you decide that you were, that the Android development was going to be like your career, that you were, you know, you were going to use that to work at some of these, because you worked at some, some pretty notable comp companies. Uh, when did you decide that, hey, that's what, this is what I'm going to do. So I think um, one thing that really helped me is a book I read, um, the Software Developer's Life Manual. And um, yeah. it's just a really great book by John Sonmez. And he's basically talking about how developers can really look at themselves as their own brand business and as a career instead of just having a job. Um, and one of the core concepts is that you need to specialize. And so um, for me, anyway, I have just always been really interested in Java. So in one way, that's a specialty. Um, but I was also doing a lot of like web frameworks and um, back end API design and things like that. And it just sort of had me all over the place. And it's hard to be um, right. an expert if you're doing, you know, four or five different things. So I just right. picked what I was the most passionate about, and, and that's Android. And so that's when I decided to pour um, even more of my energy into um, kind of perfecting my craft um, when it comes to Android development. Excellent, excellent. Uh, and, you know, this, this, this podcast is called uh, Crushing Code at the Washington Post. Um, I don't know. <laughs> that's not that's not entirely <laughs> true right now. Uh, but let me let me ask you, because I, I'm trying to I'm trying to remember. So I think I I reached out to you on Twitter, and yes. it was because of that, it was because of that tagline uh, that you had in your in your uh, your Twitter profile. It was crushing coal at the Washington Post, and I thought that is such a powerful tagline. Um, 
like I gotta have her on on a podcast. Where where did that where did that come from? So um, actually, it's funny because a few years ago, I read this article and it was sort of critiquing the bro grammar uh, culture that had sort of popped up in tech. Um, and right. one of the phrases from the article was like, um, do you bro down? Do you crush code? Then you might be a bro grammar, you know? <laughs> and it just, okay. I just thought it was hilarious um, how they worded it. And so um, for me, I think, well, you know, I guess I kind of crush code or, <laughs> or let's take, let's take this sort of um, negative connotation of just, this men's only world of, you know, growing down and crushing code and let's apply it to right. myself because I have that same sort of intensity and passion um, when it comes to programming. Um, so that's why I thought it, it would be great to be in my, my little Twitter bio. Nice, nice. I, you know what? I love it. And, and, and this is why I love it. And it's similar to uh, the tagline that Blacks and Technology use in, in, in a way because how powerful it's a crushing code sounds a lot more powerful than, Hey, I'm coding. Right. Um, it, it, it kind of exhibits this, uh, or exudes this, this kind of, you know, this confidence that, you know, you're, you're not just there coding, you're, you're crushing code. Um, and, and that's what kind of what, that's what drew, uh, uh, that's what drew me to it. And, and the reason why I say that kind of, that kind of relates to blocks and technologies um, taglines because we our tagline is, is stomping the divide right and um, I always tell people how that came about was that I, you know I was tired of hearing oh let's bridge the divide it sounded so passive to me right and um, I always thought like I don't want to just build a bridge and and just cross over or or you know we still are living on opposite sides or whatever and every once in a while i can wander over that bridge i want to crush that bridge i don't want to i don't want there to be anything at all i want this to be you know i want it to be combined or you know the two sides together so i want to stop the divide because i don't think there should be a divide there and that's what really that's what crushing code kind of reminded me of is, is that tagline so that's what that's what really drew me in so, but cool. you're not crushing code at Washington Post anymore. <laughs> so, but you worked you worked at some some pretty notable companies. You you worked uh, you what, interned at NASA. You worked at Lockheed Martin, Washington Post. So, tell me, uh, these are pretty high profile companies. Well, what 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 do you look for uh, in a company? Um. So I look for a challenge. I want to continue evolving as a developer, um, continue honing my skills. So if there's a unique problem to be solved and I think I can make a difference, then that's the place that I want to be. Got you, got you. And so um, you you just, before, before the podcast started, you mentioned to me that you're no longer at Washington Post and you're going to be starting somewhere uh, starting Monday, uh, are, are you able to tell us where you're going to be heading to? Sure. Um, I'm going to be working um, as an Android developer for a startup called Off Grid Electric. And um, okay. they're actually a social impact company. And they have offices in California okay. and Tanzania. So I'll be working remotely. Um, and the mission is, is one thing that really drew me on in is the fact that they're trying to provide affordable solar power to homes in rural Africa. So it's going to be a very exciting challenge um, to work on the Android applications for this company. Um, and I'm just really looking forward to it. Well, congratulations on that. Uh, definitely wish you much success. So let, let, let me Thank ask you. you this. So you went from all these, you know, really established companies to a, a, <laughs> to a startup. Oh, what what right. what played into that? Was it was it be, was it some of the social impact work that they're doing? I'll say yes. It's part of the social impact working on something that helps to change people's lives for the better. Also, right. I think it's as I mentioned before, I really like the challenge. So you're trying to design an Android application that is gonna have to work with limited internet connectivity. 
Um, so mm. that is just a very interesting, the sort of online, offline challenge, as we like to refer to it. Um, so right. that's going to push me as a developer to um, find new solutions, think of new algorithms, try new libraries, things that I've never had to deal with before, um, being in the sort of environment where we assume everyone always has access to the Internet. Um, so I'm just excited right. about, you know, tackling that new challenge. Interesting. And and so out of these companies, um, how how did you prepare for each of these, you know, companies? Like, you know, the interview process was, it, was you know, did you prepare for one differently than you did the other? Uh, how, how, did, how did that work out? So definitely it was a different process for, for all of them. Um, for instance, for Lockheed Martin, um, what's sort of interesting about my time there, um, when I first graduated from college, I was a little disillusioned because um, I guess maybe this was my first whiff of the discrimination that exists in tech. Um, <laughs> despite despite graduating top like in the top of my class, I did not have any job offers, and I kept being turned down by people saying, "Well, you don't have enough experience. You don't have enough experience." Where I would see like my fellow classmates getting really great job offers from same companies that I applied to, um, and they didn't wow. have jobs, and I was working at NASA at the time, so it was just like a very weird experience there. Um, but I interviewed at Lockheed Martin. And they told me something similar. Oh, you know, you don't really have a lot of experience, but we'll take you on um, to work in our help desk team. Um, so my first five months at Lockheed Martin, I was actually working um, as, as a help desk um, technician. Um, wow. And then it only, yeah, so <laughs> despite having, you know, the degree in computer engineering and at that point, I realized, okay, this is really not where I see my career heading. I need to leave. Um, but I was doing a great job. They really liked me as an employee. And so um, they offered to switch me to the development team. Um, so that's actually how I started my officially um, uh, first job as a developer at Lockheed Martin. And, and I ended up staying there for five years. Um, but, you know, it's just, just very interesting how how things work out, um, and you may assume it's about, you know, academics, especially for your first job, um, but right. really not the case, uh, unfortunately. Interesting. Um, wow, that, that kind of hit me. <laughs> that's, that's, wow, that, that kind of hit me. I didn't think it would affect me just hearing that um and i know that those type of things go on but when you when you and you re, you may read about something like that and it's a kind of a i guess a little bit of a disconnect when you're just reading it but when you're hearing it you're hearing somebody you know go through that it it it, it kind of it really kind of pisses me off like <laughs> here you are with no seriously here you are with you know you you intern at nasa uh, um, you you have a degree in, in in computer engineering, and what's so different about that is it's not <clears throat> it's a mix. So it's a mix of computer science and computer engineering. And people don't understand when you say, for instance, if I tell somebody that hey, you know, I went to school for computer network engineering, they they hear the networking part. Right, and they think, oh, you know, this guy is a network guy. You know, he knows routers and switches and things like that. But it's like, no, like there is an engineering portion of this whole entire thing, uh, the the low level circuitry that you probably never had to touch in your life. And you know, I took courses that you didn't take, and and courses that you know require serious intelligence in order to be able to pass these courses. So you had that, you had your internship at NASA, and they relegated you to working help desk. They didn't want to put you, not even an uh, entry-level role, of, not even like a junior developer, it's, it's we're going to put you, that's, uh, wow, that rubs yeah. me the wrong way. 
Yeah, it was but, definitely but, a, a hard pill to swallow initially. Um, but um, I think yeah. it was good for me because it helped me to see more of the real world. And um, little by little over the years, um, I guess it's the uh, whatever rose colored glasses they say. Um, right. You start to see the world for what it really is, and then now you have to work yeah. it to your advantage, right? Right, right, right. It's funny we we were having a discussion in um in our Slack channel yesterday, and uh, this it was a discussion about um, an article that we were we were co- having a conversation about um, that just recently was out on the internet. Um, about a young woman who was uh, working at uh, a certain notable tech company, and she has some issues with with that company and things like that. And um, we were we were talking about you know various different things, or looking at it at different angles, and 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 and, and uh, expounding on 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 the whole entire uh, situation. Uh, but one person made a comment about. Um, you know some of the things that that people were saying in in the, during the conversation about how the person acted during this whole situation. There were some missteps that this person was 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 having, and some people were uh, you know basically saying, well, you know, this this person probably shouldn't have done this, or you know they should have done this differently, and um, um, and so the person, uh, there was another a young uh, woman who um, who kind of uh, mentioned like, hey, like you know, she should have done it, she should have done that, but you know, kind of over how hostile that work environment was, and it's, and you know, somebody saying like, you know, you know, you know, that's that's part of life, like you know, there's going to be the there's going to be situations or jobs that you work at you know yeah this job shouldn't react this way or you know your 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 working environment shouldn't be hostile but the fact of the matter is it's like that and and mm-hmm. you know there's not a magic wand it's going to you know that you can wave that um that one you know that it's going to fix everything you have to learn how to navigate that right and this is not mm-hmm. so much as trying to put put down uh, or, or, or call her out for her actions. It's more. It's more like, hey, you know, we need to navigate differently in in these environments. Uh, and and what goes for somebody else, another person of a different color, doesn't necessarily uh, go for us. And we have to be aware of that. And so it, with that, we have to learn how to navigate within that within that space. Uh, and there were some serious missteps that this person had and yeah you know we feel bad for you know the things that she had to go through but we also want people to know that you can't do these type of things uh in a work environment and 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 think it's okay because your counterpart has done the same thing that's just not how it works unfortunately should it work like that yeah of course it should but we don't live in this ideal world we live in where we're in the world that we live in the real world (laughs) Right, right, and things just aren't like that, and 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 you know it's 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 hard to face sometimes, but that's you know it's just it's just how it is. Yep. So, um, what is what are some important things you know? Working at NASA, working at Lockheed Martin, working at the Washington Post look great on a resume, but what are some what are some of the important things that you've learned that, that helped you? you know, in each step of, of the way, excel in your career? Um, the most important thing I learned is that you need other people. Um, I spent so much time just focused on uh, being awesome on my own, and it never mm. gets you the recognition or the visibility that you deserve. It's only when you start mm. building your network and involving other people in your growth that you see that sort of like exponential um, acceleration in your career. And it took me a while to finally get that. Um, But now, I mean, that is just really key to uh, my current and future successes. So what was was that aha moment 
that, that you finally realize like, hey, this is the way I'm doing it is not working for me. Uh, I need to switch it up and, 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 and do it like this and, and see how see it, see what the outcome is. I think for me, the aha moment was a few years ago when um, it was sort of like around the time when promotions were being given out and I was you know, on a team and like maybe six other people, <laughs> no joke, six other people all got right. promoted and I did it. Oh, wow. But on top of it, um, we had this like annual meeting and they sort of list out all the key projects and, you know, whether or not they were successful and met their goals. And then my project was the only one that was successful. So it was just like irony of irony um, that you work oh, wow. super hard and you, you know, achieve great things. But if you don't have that visibility and you don't have that um, network, it just goes right. hidden. It's like you almost didn't do it. Um, and one of like my really great uh, mentors and role models, Chuki Chan, she always says that um, hidden work doesn't count, period. Like hidden work doesn't count. So everything you do, make sure someone sees it. And it's just so, so true. So, uh, and how does that, how do, how do you actually put that or implement that, that philosophy? So are you, you know, hey, boss, look, I, you know, I did it. I did it. <laughs> I know it's like <laughs> no. <that>. <laughs> so <laughs> actually, I mean, I'm pretty strategic about it. So, um, for instance, right. what, what did I start doing? Uh, Monday mornings, I would send an email mm -hmm. to my boss. And I would say, you know, hi, how are you? Here are my um, items for this week that I plan on achieving. Here are the related tasks. Please let me know if you have other priorities. Then at the end of the week, I follow up with, hi, just want to let you know how things turned out for me this week. These are the things I was able to accomplish. In addition, I did the following items. So first, that's disability with my own, you know, direct manager. Um, having right. a personal blog, right? So now you're getting external visibility, um, co-organizing local meetups, speaking at conferences, being an author. All these things are increasing your visibility um, and really sort of like your, your, your net worth, basically. I love it. Um, you know, that's what... You know, the Blacks of Technology platform is all about that visibility and, and, and giving uh, the exposure to people who normally probably wouldn't have it. Um, and uh, so I, I love what you just said about, you know, uh, in, increasing your own visibility and doing certain things externally uh, that's going to help increase it. So great job. Great, great. So you, so you speak at conferences. Uh, quite frequently now. So how, how did you get started with that? So um, I started small. I would speak, you know, at business meetings or, you know, lead brown bags during lunchtime. And then I started speaking at local meetups. Um, and finally, my official first conference talk, um, two women in the Android community reached out to me and said, hey, we really would love for you to speak um, at this conference that's coming up in New York. And if you need uh -huh. help, you know, preparing your proposal, um, we're willing to give you feedback and help you um, in order to submit. So, you know, I took a chance and I and I did it. Um, and that's how I got started giving my very first uh, conference talk. So how many conferences, uh, how many conferences have you spoke at so far? So many in the name or? Oh, um, I want to say maybe I've spoken at like five now. Um, okay. And it started last September. Nice, nice, nice. So, how, how do you actually how do you prepare to to give uh, a talk? What, what, what's your preparation like? So normally, I keep a list of ideas that I want to present on. So um, things that I'm sort of feeling passionate about, or a title for a conference talk that pops into my head. I keep all those things together in Trello and Evernote. And as I'm going about my developer life, 
um, I'll grab little articles or clippings from books and things, and I sort of combine them all together in one place. So um, once I submit a talk and it's accepted, that's when I'll go into more detail and I'll create an outline of what I want to cover. Then from there, I'll work on my slides. And I do put a lot of time into my slides. Um, because I want the attendees to be entertained and learn something at the same time. So I, uh -huh. I do actually um, prepare um, pretty far in advance. Like as soon as my talk is accepted, I sort of start that process. Interesting. Interesting. So what, what, uh, what are some of the notable conferences that you, that you spoke at? So my first conference um, was very notable. Um, it was JoyCon um, New York City, and they have over 800 um, developers who come. And it was really exciting because my talk was in the main auditorium, and um, nice. it was a really good turnout. And that's how I made a lot of my current um, connections within the Android community was by means of that first conference. Um, and then from there, I was invited to come speak at Android Toronto. So it was actually my first time in Canada was um, flying out there to speak at a conference. And it was just a really amazing experience for me. Um, and Canadians are so friendly. Um, so if you ever have a chance to go, uh, it was just a really, really great time um, um, going out there. So those are two of my favorite uh, conferences that I've okay. spoken at. And it's good to know about Toronto because um, um, there's some uh, pretty exciting news that um, coming up for Blacks and Technology that involves Linux and involves Toronto. <laughs> That's all I'm going to say right now. There's going to be a press release uh, coming out pretty soon. Uh, that's going to be it's, it's it's pretty exciting stuff. But it's going to allow me for the first time, hopefully, to to visit Toronto. So I'm looking I'm looking forward to that. That's really cool. So let me ask you this: and this, what what are some you know? This is probably going to happen. Uh, this trip to Toronto in, in August. What are some things that I should definitely do while I'm there? So there is this um, I guess the Starbucks of Canada called Tim Hortons. You should definitely okay. go there and get their uh, breakfast sandwich. It was really good. Okay. Um, it was some kind of bread that I've <laughs> never had before, um, and the locals go crazy for it. Um, ah, okay. Let's see. I I didn't do a lot of sightseeing, but you'll just be impressed by how clean it is and how friendly everyone is. It's It's like New York, except really clean and friendly. <laughs> <laughs> the best way I can describe Toronto. I hope nobody from New York is listening. <laughs> but of course, it, like but of course, if you're from, right. If you're from New York, you probably are shaking your head like, "Hey, I'm telling the truth." <laughs> I love New York. I'm just saying. Yeah. <laughs> we are dirty, and we are. We can be assholes at times. <laughs> well, that's that's good to know. Yeah, so yeah, I'm looking I'm looking forward to that. Um, so what advice would you would you give to other people looking to become speakers? Because, you know, there there's always that, that person that 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 uh that wants to speak and, and and may be a little bit too intimidated to speak. So what advice can would you give that that person? I would just say start small. Um, maybe you can give some short presentations to your coworkers a few times a year, mm -hmm. you know, maybe just like during lunch. And then don't feel intimidated if you feel you don't know it all because no one knows it all, even if they act like it. So just share what you <laughs> do know in a way that's beneficial right. for others. So um, whenever I start, you know, having that whole, you know, imposter syndrome or I don't right. know enough about X to talk about it, send a tweet and then just sit back and watch how many people go, wow, I never knew that. Um, and that can kind of help cure your fear because there's always someone who's sort of one step behind where you are technically right. that could benefit from your expertise. 
Very, very good advice. Um, and, and I've I haven't spoke at a conference yet, but I've I've you know spoke to um, um, uh, like colleges and um, you know small classrooms and things like that. Uh, but I'm I'm looking for you know, my first. Um, I've submitted some talks. I haven't, I haven't had one accepted yet. I think I might need a, a, a lesson in how to submit a talk, but uh, uh, I do. I definitely do want to do that. And but I'm always worried. That's you know one of those things. You know, I, I, even though I've been in the industry for you know umpteen years or whatever, there's still always that. You know, do I really know what I'm talking about? And you know, it's, especially if you have to go up in front of a, uh, an entire audience, and then you think like, "Oh my God, I'm going to be exposed." It always, I always refer back to. Uh, I don't know if you've ever seen the movie Collateral with uh, Jamie Foxx, T- Tom Cruise, uh, Jada Pinkett Smith. Maybe. <laughs> there, but but there, there's okay. So Jada Pinkett Smith in the movie, she's a lawyer, right? And Jamie mm-hmm. Fox is this cab. He he's this cab driver, and uh, she's one. She's his fare, right? Uh, and they're they're driving and they're talking and things like that. And um, so she starts telling him about how she prepares for a trial, right? And she says like every time before a trial, she um, she she goes over, you know, the trial notes and things like that. And she says, then she goes and she throws up and she says she throws up because she feels like she, you know, she's been, been faking this, this whole time. And as soon as she steps into the courtroom, uh, you know, people are going to expose her for, you know, for, you know, what she really is. And that she, people are going to think that she doesn't know what she's talking about. Uh, and then, you know, after she does that, um, Maybe she didn't say she throws up, but she said she does something. And she <laughs> and, but then she says, you know, she kind of gets herself, <laughs> she kind of gets herself together, and she goes back over her notes, and then she, you know, come court day, she's fine. But I, I, every time somebody talks about imposter syndrome, I always refer them to that clip because it really touches on like the core uh, mentality of of like. Imposter syndrome, like nobody, no matter how long somebody has been in the industry, or no matter how many wins they've had in, in their careers, they always feel like they don't know enough. And, and uh, so I always, you know, kind of refer to that and say, "Hey, take a look at this. This is probably how you feel." And they're like, "Yeah," and I'm like, "Hey, it's, you know, it's going to be all right. It's, you yep. know, she she survived it. <laughs> you, you, you just got to do it. Yeah, you just got to right. do it. And um." It was really interesting. I was listening to um, a podcast, a Tim Ferriss podcast, actually, with Jamie Foxx. And he said, what's on the other side of fear? Nothing. He's like, you know, you're so afraid of doing something, but what is really the worst that can happen? And most of the time, nothing. So just go for it and just do it. Um, and And I will say the same thing about speaking. The benefits just, like, so far outweigh um the negative and right it really helps to accelerate your your career definitely definitely you are also uh, a published author and um you you've done some training videos uh, i've seen um with o'reilly media how how did you become involved in in that um so interesting story someone um contacted me on twitter um they saw the title and description <laughs> of one of my upcoming conference talks and said, you know what, that would be a great course for O'Reilly. Um, and literally from there, I had a deal to make some some videos with O'Reilly. It was really that simple, just right time, right place, um, and saying yes to an opportunity. Very nice. And what are, what are the videos about? Um, so the course is called um, Developing High Quality Android Applications. And it's more for intermediate Android developers. And it it basically walks you through the importance of um, testing, how to do it in Android. We talk about Mm -hmm. static code analysis and just the various components of your application um, that can just really make it um, more maintainable and and of higher quality. Excellent, excellent. Uh, And so how how can people how can people actually find those videos? They just go to to O'Reilly's site and 
Yeah, you can search it on O'Reilly. Um, I also have a link um, in the sidebar on my personal blog at adavis.info. Um, okay. And like, I think I also have a link in my Twitter bio as well. Okay, excellent, excellent. So between speaking, writing, coding, training, which one of those do you like the best and, and why? And why? I definitely like coding the best. Um, it's where I'm most in my element. I'm just kind of me and my thoughts attempting to solve a problem using code. Um, and that's, you know, I guess that's my happy place. So I definitely um, love coding the best, but the other things are a close second. Nice, nice. So what's what's next for you? What are, what's what's some of your your, your future plans? So what's next? Um, I want to continue uh, conference speaking, and I've never been to Europe, so I have applied to speak at a few conferences in Europe this year, and I'm really hoping those things pan out. Um, so I think it'll be a great opportunity for me to go and see more of this um, big wide world. Um, also, Monday morning, I'll be starting my new job uh, as Android developer for Off-Grid Electric, and just excited about those new challenges and opportunities as well. Excellent. Excellent. Well, good luck uh, on on the uh, uh, the conferences. Hopefully, you know you get to speak there and, and get to uh, visit and explore Europe. Thank you very much. So before we before we wrap up, how can other people follow you? How can they contact you? How can they you know find out more about your training videos or your books or whatever anything that you're doing? How can they do that? So I'm pretty active on Twitter, um, and I'm at Brown Girl Dev minus C O N I. Um, so that's definitely the best way to get in touch with me. Excellent, excellent. Well, Anise, I definitely wish you uh, the best of luck and wish you much success in the future. I want to thank you for coming on to the show and sharing your your life with us tonight. Thanks for having me. Take care. So that is it for this episode of the Blacks and Technology Big Tech Talk podcast. Uh, I want to thank our guest, Anise Davis. If you like what you heard tonight and you want to let us know or if you have any suggestions or comments, email them to us at contactusatblacksandtechnology.net. Uh, what's coming up? Join us in two weeks Two weeks from now, March 31st. So we have Tamika Reed and Dion Parler. Uh, they are women in Linux. Uh, women in Linux is a dynamic group who celebrate Linux-centric women in technology, exposing women to other tech careers, using the foundation of Linux and a viable resource for obtaining and sustaining a thriving career in tech. Should be fun because I'm a Linux enthusiast. Uh, I met Tamika and uh, Dion at, uh, where did I meet them at? Puppet Conf? Yeah, it was Puppet Conf, uh, 2015. Uh, very knowledgeable, very excellent women. Um, Going to be happy to have them on here in two weeks. So tune in then, same time, same channel. Remember, tech yourself before you wreck yourself. Take care and have a good night. Blacks in technology. Black, 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 blacks in technology. Blacks in technology. Black, blacks in technology. Blacks in technology. Black, blacks in technology.